and watch Amador County's number one news and sports leader, TSPN. TSPN is happy to bring you Foothill Critters, a show for and about local pets, farm animals, and wildlife of our Foothill community. This program is brought to you in part by the, hey Tom, you should do this part. <laughs> By the Feed Barn, country store, locally owned and operated for more than 30 years. By Jeff Holman Auto Center, a name you can trust for 28 years and growing. And by Sierra Hearth and Home, your certified specialists for water gardens, ponds, and waterfalls. <laughs> Welcome to Foothill Critters. Today we're here with Jim and Bonnie Sally at their ranch where they're raising chickens. Jim. Tell me a little bit about why you've been raising chickens all these years and how many. We started raising chickens way back in 1969 and both Bonnie and I have always really enjoyed it. Uh, we're part of uh, a really a great club of poultry breeders throughout California and the western United States and our club has been very popular and we found it to be a very rewarding hobby with a lot of fun and a lot of involvement with youth which we both enjoy. Terrific and Bonnie I think that you're involved with fur and feathers and um, I know that you all believe that the raising of animals teaches kids great lessons so how tell me a little bit about that. I became involved with the fair about oh, probably eight years ago shortly after we moved here and um, it's just fun. I don't know much about rabbits but I've been able to help the building of the uh, poultry quite a bit at the fair and we just we're, we've become pretty involved in it. Terrific. Thank you and thank you for opening your um, ranch to us where we can go and see some chickens. Now we're in the brooder room and Bonnie's going to be pulling chicks out of the incubator. Tell me a little bit about how this process works Jim. Well, this is where it all starts. Uh, as you know, uh, chicken eggs take 21 days to hatch, and we set weekly. So Bonnie's pulling out one of our last groups of chicks, actually, for the season. And uh, what we do here is uh, identify the birds. Um, each pen is kept separately, so we know the ancestry of each individual bird. And we're going to actually mark the, the web of the feet so we know what, how to pedigree them and which pin they came from, so we know the ancestry. And then after that, we're going to do some Merrick's disease vaccination, which protects them from getting Merrick's disease, which we can talk a little bit more about later. Okay, and how does this marking process work? Basically, we use the web between the toes, and I use a little pair of cuticle scissors and make a very small V which really doesn't even make them bleed and then as they grow up that expands and and when we go into judging and rating later or mating pins you can look to see where the little V was cut and you know what pin that bird came from so you can control the line breeding of your program if you know the ancestry the pedigree of the bird okay so do you do a different clip for different groups or different webbing? Yes, we have a system that we use. Uh, I, uh, we call it, it's a left foot, right foot thing and 1A is uh, outside left and, and 1B is inside left and then we also have a, occasionally we'll have a 1C which will clip both webs and then do the same thing on the right foot. So we're actually able to pedigree six pins of any individual variety of a breed. Oh, that sounds like a really interesting system. So the chicks that we're looking at now are less than 24 hours old? Yes, yeah. They, they're they just about uh, 18 to 24 hours old. We usually like to leave them in the incubator until they're a little dry and fluffy. And uh, then shortly after that, they do need to get their first drink and uh, start the chick feed. And we also use a little booster, which... Uh, helps them get a little vitamin start and uh, helps them recuperate from the whole incubation process. Okay, so you have three incubators here. How many hatches do you have going on right now? We're on the last incubator, the last two batches actually. This is the next to the last batch for the entire season. We actually only use three incubators about three or four weeks out of the season 
And then when we get enough of a certain breed or variety of that breed, then we can start cutting back. Uh, and right now we're down to uh, about three varieties. And it was mainly ones that uh, where you didn't get the numbers that you wanted. So we're trying to, we have target amounts that we like to raise. And say if we have 40, 44 chicks and we wanted 50, we'll put a few more eggs in to kind of round it off. Okay, and what temperature are these breeders at? We like to run ours at about 99.7. Uh, there's a lot of variation in there. Uh, some people do 99 and a half, and some people do a little over 100. But I usually set ours right around 99 and three quarters, and then you try to get the incubators to maintain that temperature as close as possible. Okay, now Bonnie is putting the um, tray back into the incubator, and there are still some chicks in there. Is that because they're not large enough yet? Correct. They haven't quite dried out. Because we have so many different varieties and breeds, some will actually start hatching on uh, the 20th day or uh, late 19th day, and then some are always dragging up the rear, so they might hatch out half a day late after that 21st day. So usually we go through two or three stages of taking the chicks out and marking them and uh, vaccinating and so forth. Just to take them out at the optimum time. Now what varieties do we have here? These are uh, black-breasted red modern game. You can see they kind of have a longer leg and uh, you like them to stand up. Some of these uh, stand up pretty easily. <laughs> They're very cute chicks. Uh, and this is another type of modern game called Birchen. And then the last ones here, these little dark ones, these are the show type New Hampshire Bantams. Uh, they, they come out a little, uh, a little darker, kind of have a cinnamon red color to them. And um, we were a little short on these this year, so we decided to throw in a few more eggs. And we only raise about 20 or 24 a year of those. The modern games, we raise around 250 a year. We have quite a few of those. Okay, and what, what do you do with the modern games? They're primarily for show. Kids love them for showmanship. Um, they're very docile. They, they will quickly identify with a kid. A lot of kids carry them around on their shoulder, and even at the fairs, they're, they're, they like people. They're very easy to be around and uh, they're very easy to train to walk with a stick during the showmanship process. So a lot of our moderns are sold to, to kids for showmanship. Okay, terrific. So have they been marked? We're yeah. going to do that now. Well, we'll mark them now. I'll show you the system we use. And this is pretty much a system that Bonnie and I use. Um, we developed this literally 25 years ago and it's always been an easy way and we can look back for several years and see a certain mark on a bird and, and I know what pin it came from. I know the ancestry of that bird. So we're very careful with our line breeding program so we can keep that going. And is, I know ancestry is important with the rabbits. Is that important with the chickens that the uh, kids who are showing are able to show that as well? Yes, it is important, not as important as, as rabbits or some other animals because you actually can breed a little closer for a few years, but we're very careful. I don't like to do what's called inbreeding so much, but I do like line breeding where you stay within the same family and keep that line going. It's kind of a sustainable path that you can continue for years and years if you do it correctly. Okay, now we're going to mark and vaccinate these chicks? Yes. We'll start off by, by doing the, the toe clip method that we use. And uh, as I mentioned, we uh, will take a chick, and I always uh, use this. This is actually the left foot, the left leg. And our system would indicate that outside left is our pin 1A. And what I do, I'm going to take the cuticle scissors, and I snip a little small V right in the end of that and make sure it comes loose because if you just do one they will grow back together sometimes so I that's why I like to make the little V so it doesn't grow back together then we'll put that one here and I'll grab another one a little New Hampshire these are all from pin 1A which Bonnie has indicated with the egg she put in here so everything in this box 
is going to be clipped outside left and uh, put that in here and then uh, we'll go through the whole system um, there again the the right foot indicates the, the number two pin also a b and c so but everything here happens to be one a so we'll put the other ones later and I'll do one more here to show you doesn't seem to hurt and they rarely bleed, bleed so uh, it's proven to be a pretty good method as you can see it just makes a little V cut right in there and then as they grow up that's easily identifiable on the mature bird okay now we're going to talk about your vaccination program for Merrick's disease yes uh, we use a vaccine and it's very important that that be done between the incubator and the brooder so before we put these chicks in the brooder we like to uh, vaccinate them for Mary's and in order to do that usually it's kind of a two-person job I take a very small needle and I have the vaccine already prepared with an extender and I sort of grab the nape of the neck and inject the needle lightly under the skin and we apply two tenths of one cc of the vaccine and then Bonnie will put it in the brooder and we go through and individually vaccinate each chick. Okay, and that vaccination is against something that you call Merrick's disease. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how serious that disease is and why you don't want it on your property. Is that correct? Yes, it's very important to vaccinate chicks for Merrick's disease. It's a very common virus that's around. And, and ordinarily, when you buy birds, uh, even from a feed store or another supplier, you should be sure that they have been vaccinated for it. Okay, so now we're out with the chickens. Uh, what would you call this area? Uh, this is the, the, the ground pins that, uh, where we move the chicks from the brooding room out on the ground. And we still uh, put them out in stages. Uh, earlier in the season especially, they need a little warmth yet. So each pin has uh, got a little brooding light. We use a little mother hen in there and we still kind of move them along uh, every week as they progress in age. Okay, and so you've just vaccinated. Can you tell us a little bit about why that vaccination is so important with your system and a little bit about the disease itself? Well, this is a good example of why it is important to vaccinate for Merrick's disease. Um, we usually vaccinate between the incubator and the brooder and then once you introduce them to the ground, you're actually exposing them to the possibility of getting Merrick's disease. Uh, Merrick's disease is a herpes virus. It's very easily transmitted. There's three ways to actually uh, prevent it or to deal with it. One is the, the vaccination process, which we've just done. And the other one is uh, called acquired immunity, where you can introduce turkey manure with the chicks or put them in a pen where turkeys have been known to run and they develop this acquired immunity and then the third method is simply breeding from birds that that are immune to it and you let nature kind of take its course and the survivors become your breeding stock each subsequent year this is the first pen that we we place the chicks in once they leave the brooding room and as you can see i have a double light system here i have a little mother hen which is a light bulb inside and they snuggle around that on cool evenings and then the other little hanging uh, light they they can sleep under there if they like you you want to make that transition as as painless as possible for the chicks um, and we usually move them down into a, a subsequent pen about every week uh, during the spring in, in the foothills we get a lot of variation in temperature some nights are actually uh, you know down to 25 or 30 degrees and and you have to protect them and make sure they stay comfortable so this late in the year it gets a little easier to do that because the temperature isn't quite as harsh on them uh, we usually just literally run them from pin to pin with a little bit of uh, a little fencing operation so we don't have to individually handle them and uh, I also at this stage change from a chick starter to a chick grower. Uh, all that means is you're dropping the protein level about three or four percent 
and sometimes I mix them together so you don't have a real fast transition but I like to keep the chicks on about a 17 18 percent protein grower at this stage how old and, are they at this stage? Uh, this is uh, right here. There again, we're a little faster in the warmer time of the year. Um, this uh, earlier in the season, we move them along at about five to six weeks. Now we're actually taking them out of the brooding room at, at three to four weeks because uh, it's it's nice to be outside, especially on a day like today. We're where we're in the low 70s already. And what's the bedding that you have them on? Uh, we usually use a mixture of uh, rice hulls and uh, pine shavings and stir it up a little bit and uh, try to replace it. it, it uh, they mess it up very fast, but uh, a bedding of about 50-50 seems to work best for us. Rather than automatic watering, we, we like the little one gallon waterers that you see here. Uh, it makes it very easy to to add vitamins and any additives that you want to put in. Plus, we on warm days we change these twice, and uh, some days when it's kind of mild and and they keep the water clean, you only have to change it once a day. So, this is the last uh, pin four of the growing stage, and from here will actually be moving them across the aisle and which means they'll no longer have heat. Uh, they don't need it after this. So we be sure that it's not a cold night when we move them. You know, something, you know, where it's going to be pretty mild. And pre preventing stress on chicks is one of the more important things. Uh, you have to really pay attention to the environment and to the elements. Well, earlier we saw that Bonnie um, helped a chick being hatched a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, we <laughs> we do help chicks once in a while. Some people don't like to do that because uh, her heredity-wise, uh, you want them to hatch naturally and be a tougher chick. Uh, I've always felt that uh, they don't hatch quite as well from an incubator as they would under a mother hen. So if a chick almost makes it, we'll help it a little bit to, to kind of compensate for that difference and then kind of watch them. We still lose a couple of chicks that have trouble hatching. It just means they're weaker. And in the long run, you really want to have a almost a survival of the fittest mentality because you want to produce healthy chicks that are going to make your bloodline a little tougher down the road. These chicks um, are really cute and quite a variety. Um, what age are the ones in this pen that we're looking at right now? Um, these actually get up to about seven weeks. And as I say, we've moved these along a little faster. So in some cases, there's barely a, week di uh, a week's worth of difference in them. Um, earlier in the season, there's a definitely a week between each group. Now, these chicks you seem to keep them together in similar size and is that normal and why? Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, I, we do like to have the same ages together so the, the big guys don't eat all the feed and bully the little ones around. Um, quickly after we move them across the aisle, which we'll get to here in a second, the, I start separating them into varieties and breeds because they coexist a lot better when when they are the same size in, in addition to the same age. Who's this one that we're looking in this uh, pen right here, the big black chicken? Oh, that's uh, an extra male. That's a black Wyandotte uh, that actually belongs to a friend of ours, but uh, he's in there all by himself, and we don't actually even raise that variety. We're kind of holding it for them. So. Okay, Jim, tell me about these transition pens from the first ones, um, what's different in these second set of pins? The main difference here in the larger pins is that they don't have heat any longer. Uh, we move them over and uh, also I tend to change the feet a little bit. One concern we always have when we put them in the larger pins uh, is uh, uh, there again on cool nights they tend to pile up in the corners and as you can see, we use a little screen effect over here on the left. Um, 
and then some of these wire baskets that we put in the corners. And that keeps the birds from sleeping on top of each other because once in a while on a cold night, the two birds on the bottom will, will actually suffocate. So we're very careful to try to prevent them from uh, piling up too much. And at least if they sleep on the wire, they get a little more oxygen underneath the pile so we don't lose any. So that's one concern. And uh, once the weather starts to warm up at night, that no longer is, is an issue. Um, you can see also here, I, I, I'm able to put out uh, two or three different kinds of feed. I like to mix it up a little bit when we move them and sort of let them eat what, what we feel is good for them at the time. And I also have two water supplies. I, I have uh, the little giant waterers, which are automatic flow, and then I still use some of the one gallons because I like to put a few vitamins in the water at this stage. They grow so fast, I really don't want them to be deficient in anything. So we're kind of careful to keep a very light vitamin content in some of the one-gallon waterers. Okay, so you say you feed different types of feed. Um, what are the different types? Uh, I still use a little bit of the chick starter from the inside, which runs uh, the turkey starter, which we sometimes use for, for chickens will actually be 26, 27 percent protein. And then uh, we also have a, a regular chicken starter, which is about 21 percent. And uh, I'll give them a choice of those two, um, because you still want them to have plenty of protein. But they seem to like the lower protein feed a little better, so I give them a little bit of a choice there. It looks like um, one's a little uh, smaller than the other, so the, is the baby chick uh, starter the uh, really fine feed? Yes, that's true. You want something so that uh, it's easy to pick up with their with their little mouths and uh, we have kind of a problem with some of the feeds, especially the turkey starter because obviously it's made for turkeys and uh, the chicks kind of pick through it and leave some of the larger crumbles there. So I, uh, if it's clean, I try to recycle a little bit of that, but they don't they don't always eat it. So. Okay, and so how old are the chickens in these pens before you start separating them out again? Usually it'll get up to right around seven to nine weeks, and uh, at that stage then I'll start separating them according to breed and variety. We'll be back with more Foothill Critters right after this break. <laughs> and now back to Foothill Critters on TSPN. going to talk about uh, showing chickens and the different attributes that you look for in a good showing chicken and how to prepare for show. After we go through the stage of growing them out in these ground pens, uh, we'll start to put them out. These, this is our show pens. Uh, there's 12 pens here and I usually take an entire class and put out and we evaluate them. Uh, pick out the ones that we want to show and uh, we put a sample here of uh, three different breeds with uh, uh, some different attributes that you would like to see in a show bird. Uh, one of the main things obviously is is to have a nice uh, curb appeal we call it. You know you want a good general impression that being finished in the mold having a nice healthy shiny plumage um, the bird here that we see first is a, a Birchin modern game hen and uh, this is a breed that requires them to be long in the leg and have a nice reach. As you can see Bonnie is training this bird to come up and follow her fingertips. The judge wants to see a, a good reach there with a nice short body and short wings. Um, Second bird is a silver laced wine dot, very attractive bird. Uh, each feather is laced with a black lacing. They have a nice balanced look. Uh, this bird has a rose comb and uh, has yellow legs, which are required. Um, this time of year, the birds are not quite as good a condition as they would be in the fall and winter season. 
but uh, still look pretty presentable. Makes a very attractive bird. These are very uh, popular with people for the backyard because they like the color. So, and um, next we have a white leghorn bantam male. The this is a cockerel from last year, which of now, of course, is about 14 months old. Um, these you want them to be snow white. Uh, people don't realize it's actually a lot easier to keep white birds white than some people think. Uh, basically, if you keep them on a nice dry litter and uh, change it only a couple of three times a year, uh, they will stay white. And uh, they have a single comb which requires five points on the comb and you want a full flowing tail with what they call a, a leghorn sweep to the back. You don't want much of a break you know when the tail leaves the back area and there again you want a nice yellow leg um, and uh, white earlobes which kind of contrast with the pretty red face that they have and in contrast to that we have a white leghorn hen they're required to have a floppy comb, which some people find kind of cute. There again, it's a single comb with five points, and uh, they they can flop to either side. Uh, it doesn't make any difference which way they flop. They have the white earlobes. Once they lay quite a few eggs, as you can see, their leg color starts to fade from a rich yellow to a, a lighter yellow uh, compared to the male. Uh, this is a very popular breed because they're very docile. They're very easy to uh, to handle. Bonnie's going to handle this uh, white leghorn hen and give you an idea of what, what one might look for when they're uh, checking out their birds, getting ready for a show. Um, you want the wing condition to be finished. Uh, the wing consists of three parts. That is, the, the primary flights on the outside the secondary is on the inside and then there's a small axial feather uh, in the middle and that's a favorite showmanship question for a lot of us understanding the anatomy of the wing um, we also examine the bird for any kind of broken feathers and if you do this long enough before show you've got time to pull that feather and let it come back in normally um, Bonnie will demonstrate later about how to give a bird a bath and how to clean them up. Uh, cleaning them up includes trimming the, the beak a little bit. You want to uh, trim the end back so that it's all nice and rounded out. And then we also clip toenails and so they're all the same length and you don't have any toenails that are sticking to the flooring of the show cage. And of course you want to check for any kind of external parasites which Rarely you get, but on occasion, you know, you can get some uh, some mites, some foul mites, or uh, some other little critter that wants to crawl on. But if you pay attention to your birds, that happens very seldom. This is a, a large uh, buff Orpington cockbird, which we showed a great deal last year. Buff Orpingtons are, you know, one of the prettier birds that belong in the English class. Um, all of the points for these. Uh, chickens uh, come from the American Poultry Association standard of perfection. They have very specific guidelines as to what you want birds to look like, uh, color, size, weight, everything is spelled out so you have something very definite to go by. There's also an American Bantam Association standard which further gets into other varieties of bantams but Standards are very important if you're going to show birds. You need to adhere to those as closely as possible. Um, Buff Orpingtons uh, are one of the varieties. Uh, there are several. They're very popular. They're excellent egg layers, uh, easy to handle. And other than their weight, which uh, runs around 10 pounds, uh, they're pretty easy to handle in that they don't flop around and fight and pick kids and so forth. A few of the kids have them, but uh, they make a very nice show bird. The golden buff color has actually a, quite a sheen to it, especially in the fall when they have their new plumage, so they make a very attractive display for the showroom. My job on this farm is preparing the birds for show, and that includes 
after we pick out the ones that we are going to show, I give them their bath and get them all show ready. We actually wash in the house, which makes it nice, because in the winter then you have uh, warm, wa warm water. And the room that is now our brood or incubation room, we set up uh, drying pens so we can and turn the heater on so we can just wash them, put them in there, and they dry. So after, I mean, the birds don't really mind a bath. In fact, these little girls always talk the whole time. And so you shampoo them, dip them in, get them really clean, use a brush to scrub their feet, and get them washed under here, under there. And then when you take them out, well, I dry them off a little bit, you know, so they're not drippy, drippy. And then I wrap them in a towel, keeping their feet together so that they can't get away. Then I put them down on the counter, and then I clip their bill. file it and you try and get it back into the, you know, so it doesn't have the square corners. And then look at it to make sure it's good enough. And then we use a uh, Vetrex after they're washed. We'll put it on their comb, put it on their, pretty much all over their face because it gives them a nice sh shine and it's good for them, for them to smell that. So that's all they do with that part, and then it, my, the last thing I do is take them out, let them stretch a little bit, and then I clip their toenails. And I like to clip this way because then it more or less looks like uh, they haven't actually been clipped because they're sort of not the square cut that a lot of people do. But yeah, we do this. Picked out a good bird that has long toenails. And then when that's done, we check. Moderns don't very often have stubs, but some birds have stubs, mm -hmm. which is a little feather growing where it's not supposed to be, especially if it's a clean-legged bird. And then you just go through, and I always keep tweezers, so if I have to pull them out, then I pull them out. Because if you don't pull them out, your bird can be disqualified if the judge sees the stubs. And then that's it. We take the bird, put her in her cage, let her dry. And like with these moderns, we train them. We have to make sure that they are not wild in the pen, that when the judge comes, they'll stand up tall and know what's going on. And that's pretty much all we do. And then when you transport them, of course, be sure that they're in a box that has nice, clean shavings because you don't want to spend all your time washing a bird and have it get to the show and be dirty. We put these on so that when they're in the show cage, some of these birds look a lot of alike. And then the leg band is on their coop tag and so that when the judges take them out, they'll always know to get them back in the right cage, too. And we sometimes put breeder bands on them, like the, our little outside left up there is a green band, but she doesn't have hers. But then we just put zip ties, colored zip ties on them. We'll be back with more Foothill Critters right after this break. <laughs> Sierra Hearth and Home. Sales, service, Installation, Certified Specialist, Wood, Gas, Pellet Stoves, Waterfall, Pond Kits, Hearth, and Water Garden Accessories. Sierra Hearth and Home. Okay, next we're going to talk about growing a home flock and what it takes. Okay, uh, these actually uh, are some of the older ones that we've had after we've moved them across. We just started separating the cockerels from the pullets. This happens to be one of the older age groups that we have. Um, these birds are actually about uh, two and a half months old, and they're all cockerels. These are Colombian is the variety, and the breed is Plymouth Rock. Uh, the older chicks tend to run pretty high on the cockerel side. There's about 70% cockerels, 
and only 30% of the pullets that are left next door. Um, so these will actually be culled a little heavier and we do get a lot of calls for people that want to take some of the lower end cockerels and use them for backyard chickens because they're still very healthy, very attractive birds. They lay the same amount of eggs. Um, when people leave here we always caution them to be careful with where they put their birds. They still need protection at night from predators and the neighbors dogs and so forth. It's a constant problem so think a little bit about you know the housing that you're going to have and uh, so you can take good care of them but a lot of people just want backyard birds. They, they really don't care too much about the show and of course the kids, the youth with 4-H and FFA and Grange and so forth, a lot of the kids love showing them at the fairs and, and the youth shows and showmanship and so forth. So these would be pet birds as opposed to egg laying birds? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, some of the bantams lay more than others. Uh, Colombian Plymouth Rocks, for example, lay fairly well, but nothing lays, for example, like the large buff Orpingtons that we looked at, and even the white leghorn bantams are excellent layers, and they will lay a couple of hundred eggs a year. So people like those. Not only are they pretty, but they get a few small eggs for the for the breakfast table. Now tell us how you separate the cockerels and how you tell the difference between the cockerels and the pullets. In this case, the cockerels have a, a larger, redder uh, comb, and wattles and earlobes tend to develop early. Uh, you can also see there's quite a bit of color starts to show up in the saddle. That's that feathered area right in front of the tail on the back. Uh, they'll get a little black striping there. The pullets will have a little of it, but it'll actually go away as they mature. And the cockerels tend to get more and more as they mature. So uh, in another six weeks, there'll be a d decided difference between the two colors. Okay, and if people want to raise their own chicks at home, what's the percentage of cockerels to hens? Is there a n kind of a norm? Across the board, it's considered about 55% cockerels. Uh, as I say, this is one variety where you get about 70% cockerels, but uh, across the board with all breeds of chickens and so forth, it's, it's right around 55, 56%. So if you have backyard chickens, do you really want a whole lot of cockerels? Will they fight? Will they behave? Usually that is a problem. You want as few males as you can have. If they're raised together and you don't separate them quite often, they'll get along for their entire life. But you should never add a new male to a flock where the peaking order has been already established because all you do is disrupt the flow of things and you can cause some problems. Well, I think the males are beautiful and I love to hear them crow, but do you really need to have a male in your backyard flock? No, you really don't. Uh, they lay the same amount of eggs regardless of where a male is present or not. Obviously, if you want to raise chicks, you have to have the male, but a lot of people nowadays, especially the the youth uh, just buy females. We've had people come in and buy five or six females and they can't have a male because their neighbors are too close or they don't like the crowing, they have no desire to raise the chicks. So females are in much more demand than, than the males, unfortunately. So with the males, since you say this variety has 70% males, um, what do you do when you have a whole lot of males? I just call heavier and earlier. Um, we, we're very tough on, for example, uh, this, this breed has a single comb that requires five points and in a very competitive class, if you have a bird that has seven or eight points on its comb, it's, it's not going to be very showable. So I usually sell those for backyard flocks or uh, we'll take them to a local feed store and sell them for people that just want something to look at in their backyard. Okay, and these, uh, if you have them in your backyard, they do eat bugs and uh, root around and, and uh, they're kind of fun as little pets, aren't they? They do make great pets. Um, in a lot of the uh, breeds actually are very good about only eating insects and foraging around. Uh, a lot of the Asiatic breeds, for example, 
uh, don't even eat plants, but some of them will pick out your vegetable garden and uh, whack off a few leaves that you'd rather not <laughs> lose. Okay, now we're going to talk about the difference between breed and variety. Jim, can you tell us the difference? Well, all of the breeds are recognized by the American Poultry Association, and they furthermore recognize certain varieties. Uh, a lot of the more popular breeds can have many different color varieties, and uh, to be accepted into the standard, you have to adhere to the requirements of, of one of those varieties. Uh, we have a couple of three breeds here where we have uh, three or four different color varieties. The best example is our modern game bantams, which Bonnie has already showed you on selection. But we have four different color varieties of those. The uh, black and silver hackled ones are called birchen. And uh, the ones over here on the right, we have some, uh, there's two types of black, black breasted red. Uh, one is a blue breasted red. And the other one is just simply a black breasted red, which is the intense color. Uh, blue is a dilute of the black, but it actually still is two different varieties. In pin two, this is uh, pretty much another color variety. Uh, these are called brown reds. And uh, the other birds are, are actually more black-breasted reds and blue-breasted reds. We just have them kind of split up. The uh, brown reds are one of the more popular varieties. Kids love that color. It's black, and um, the, the hackle color is kind of a orangey-red uh, color, and it makes a nice contrast. I see that you have a lot of wire here with your caging and some visqueen on the outside. Can you tell a little bit about that for our backyard flock? Well, ventilation and temperature control is very important, especially with bantams that uh, maybe aren't quite as tough as some of the larger fowl. Um, the bottom of these pens is, is solid, and we put a little bit of light uh, plastic uh, for light, but the top half is aviary wire. And in the summer, uh, that's totally exposed, so you get a lot of ventilation that comes in. The rolled visqueen that you see is for winter. Uh, we put that down when it's raining or windy or uh, you, you know having a snowstorm or something like that. We try to do a little bit of temperature control. And generally, chickens don't like a draft. Anytime it's raining uh, and they get windy also, it, it can be very harmful to them. So we try to protect them from that. Okay, Jim, what the heck is this rooster doing in with the hens and the wrong breed? <laughs> that does make kind of a funny story. This is one of our breeding males. Uh, he's a black-breasted, red, old English game bantam. And uh, when we took him out from his girls after the breeding season was over, he actually was going downhill pretty pretty fast and uh, he happened to uh, be hanging around these white Wyandotte hens and he went back in the pen with them that, that next evening and they seemed to uh, kind of like having them there so I've just left him for a couple of months. This is actually the Colombian Plymouth Rock hens that we uh, uh, used. Uh, we compared these with the young ones downstairs uh, once the breeding season is over, uh, I put all the hens together and leave them there until next season. Uh, we will be showing two or three out of here. But very, very pretty color variety, but this is what they look like when they're totally ma mature. Okay, we're wrapping it up at the home of Jim and Bonnie Sally and all the chickens and foothill critters. So tell me, what do you enjoy best about raising chickens? I think all of the friends that we've made throughout the country. Without a doubt, the people, the friends, and uh, we've got a lot of people that share the same love that we do, and we just can't wait to get together and, you know, at the shows and have a great time. So, are you saying that you are happily henpicked? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that wraps it up for Foothill Critters.
Foothill Critters is show for and about local pets, farm animals, and wildlife of our Foothill community have been proudly brought to you in part by the... Hey, Critter, let me do that part. Well, yeah, okay, it's your part anyway. <laughs> by the Feed Barn, country store, locally owned and operated for more than 30 years. By Jeff Holman Auto Center, a name you can trust for 28 years and growing. And by Sierra Hearth and Home, your certified specialists for water gardens, ponds, and waterfalls. <laughs>